All right, we're just getting prepared here to go to Acts chapter number 12. So if you have your Bible, you can open to Acts 12. And if you have your notebook, we'll be starting out on page 151 in the notebook. But let me just uh, give you some preliminary thoughts before we get going and we get into the text of Scripture. Just a reminder, the book is primarily historical and transitional. The book of Acts picks up where the Gospels leave off. You could go to uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 51. That would be a good place to go back to. Acts sets forth the actions of the apostles. That's where it gets its name, the Acts of the Apostles. There's a primary spokesperson in the first approximately half of the book up through the chapter that we are going to study here today. Uh, chapter number 12, and then chapter number 13, to the end of the book, the primary spokesperson becomes the Apostle Paul. The book of Acts, just to remind you, is a book of transitions. It takes us from the Old to the New Testament. It takes us from a focus on Israel, the Old Testament nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, to the New Testament, to the New Testament church. It takes us from a primarily Jewish Uh, emphasis in the Old Testament and even through the book of Matthew and we can see that even in the Gospels the other Gospels it takes us to the uh, Jews and Gentiles and then ultimately it appears that the majority of believers and the majority of the efforts of the uh, missionaries uh, Paul and Barnabas seem to be aimed at uh, Gentiles although they're always stopping at the synagogue on their way into town to make sure that the Jews uh, have heard the gospel themselves. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The center of the gospel started out to be in Jerusalem. We see that through the first eight chapters of the book, nine chapters, ten chapters in that area. That's where uh, Paul the Apostle is converted in, uh, uh, in those chapters. We also see the Ethiopian eunuch. In chapter number 8, we see Cornelius the, uh, of the Italian band, the Roman centurion Cornelius, converted in chapter 10. Chapter 11, Peter relates to the believers, to the other apostles, what is taking place in this, this great transition from Jew to Gentile. And then we get into chapter number 12 and we see really the last chapter that emphasizes the leadership of uh, Peter. So here we are. Just look at your introduction there on page 151. We're approaching the midway point of the book of Acts. Our goal has been to study the lives, practices, and the theology of the first century Christian church. The overwhelming theme is that God has called his people to be witnesses. We point that out in your notes time and time again. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That's the original commission that Jesus gave to his disciples. They're to be witnesses or mouthpieces for the gospel. God will accomplish his intended purposes. And frankly, for you and for me, it's a privilege to partner. We are laborers together with God. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 and we have the privilege and opportunity to partner with the Lord in the preaching and distribution of the gospel message there's a review of Acts chapters 1 through 11 I would encourage you to um, just to kind of think through the whole book and pick out a word or a phrase from each chapter um, week by week as we go through this and um, the goal would be that by the time we get to the end of the book that you could stop and you could take a word or a phrase and go through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, all the way through the book of Acts and just get the general context of all 28 of the chapters. Then on 151, we have an outline for the chapter that we're going to look at right now. We notice that James is martyred, that's Roman numeral number one, and Peter is imprisoned here. Uh, it's interesting, one, one is martyred, the other is imprisoned. Why not the other way around? We don't have an answer to that question. I don't have an answer to that question. Maybe someone else does. But you can see the outline here, and by the time we get to uh, Roman numeral number six, it says Barnabas and Paul 
return to Antioch and they prepare themselves uh, and the church at Antioch prepare themselves to commission Paul and Barnabas to go unto the Gentiles. So let's look at the bottom of 151, pick up our reading, chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, that is, around Passover. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So we, uh, we'll just stop there for a moment and notice Herod. There, Herod is a very common name in Scripture, and it's easy to get confused on the name because there are different Herods that actually played important parts in the life of Christ, all the way back to his birth, all the way through his crucifixion, and then even into the New Testament church after the ascension of Christ. So we've given you some notes there uh, on that, and I would encourage you to straighten these three out. You've got Herod Agrippa, you've got Herod the Great, and you've got Herod Antipas, all essentially of the same family, but they're three different individuals. Now something that I think that's important about noting historical individuals, and Luke is a great historian, not only a physician, but historian, but Luke has intentionally mentioned people in places, in events, in uh, his gospel, in the gospel of Luke, and also in the book of Acts, he's done that to validate that what we're reading isn't just a fairy tale, but, it's a, but it is a true story, and it is validated by facts along the way, facts which have been historically validated. I can't remember where I read this, but someone said that Luke references, and it may even be in my notes here somewhere, that Luke references 80 different people and places and events just to show that he's not writing off the top of his head some kind of a fictitious story about a man who may have lived named Jesus, and of course, uh, recording the um, missionary journeys of Paul and others. He killed James. James is the first of 12 apostles to be martyred with a sword. He was uh, most likely beheaded. That's the, the reference there. He was the brother of, of John, and uh, he was one of Jesus' inner circle. He shows up at the Mount of Transfiguration, other places where he was uh, seen to be in the, uh, the group of Peter, James, and John. And these two, James and John, were brothers. Jesus warned his disciples that there would be persecution. And indeed, Peter was imprisoned, certainly was persecuted. I'm sure it wasn't a pleasant experience. But uh, John the Baptist was beheaded. James was beheaded. And of course, tradition tells us that the uh, disciples, the apostles, that uh, many of them lost their lives to martyrdom. He saw, that is Herod, he saw that it pleased the Jews, you know, so this was uh, to his political advantage that he did this. And he delivered him uh, to four quaternions, that would be 16 soldiers, a quaternion would be four soldiers, four times four, 16. So Herod wanted to make sure that uh, this incarceration uh, was not a failure. So he used 16 soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth. Now, uh, some people uh, criticize the King James Bible for uh, translating Pascha, the Greek word here, as Easter, uh, when it could be and should be, in some people's minds, it should be translated Passover. That's why the note is at the bottom of the page here. The fact of the matter is, is that Herod was not celebrating the Passover. Herod was a pagan, and he was celebrating, uh, at the time of the Passover, he was celebrating a pagan feast, the uh, Feast of Easter, celebrating uh, Estarte or Ishtar. These were pagan goddesses. 
And uh, so Herod wasn't a Jew celebrating the Passover. But that's why the King James translators translated the word Pascha, pas, pa, uh, not Passover, and translated it Easter. So Herod uh, is going to wait till the celebration is over. He thinks that the timing would be bad to do anything. We pick up on verse 5 of chapter 12 that Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So uh, we're making sure that he's not going to get out here. There's great security around Peter. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Sounds like a miracle to me, does it not? And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not, or he knew not, that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. He was, he was so caught up in this, maybe he was so sleepy, uh, he was awakened or whatever at this time, or couldn't believe his eyes, and he said, is this a dream? Is this reality? That's what the scriptures are telling us there uh, in verse 10. And when Peter co was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Again, Herod and incarcerated Peter purposely because he knew that it would gain favor with the Jews. And uh, remember, these are the same people that uh, crucified Christ. Uh, so they've, are, they've already got a bad track record when it comes to dealing with people who are um, witnesses for Jesus Christ. Now, I just put a question here in your notes in the middle of the page. Why is James martyred and why does Peter escape? And I, I don't have an answer to that. I think we could speculate on that, but I don't have an answer. But notice in verse number five of the text that prayer was made without ceasing uh, for Peter and for Peter's release from prison. And it says, it says without ceasing, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We know the scripture tells us also in the New Testament that we ought to pray without ceasing. Their prayer lives were taken to the limit, I suppose, uh, using that phrase, without ceasing. So Peter was sleeping, <laughs> as we noted. He probably wasn't too anxious, trying to get a good night's sleep. He must have felt comfortable in his environment, in spite of his environment, knowing that he was doing what God had called him to do. He's between two soldiers, bound with two chains, double security on him. And the angel of the Lord came upon him, as we said, a little bit disoriented. And um, again, we can see the various progression as he leaves the prison, it, uh, that he went through the first and the second ward, the iron gate, the two soldiers, the two chains. This was indeed miraculous that he would escape these conditions. And you could understand a little bit later when Herod's a little bit ticked off that he escaped. How could this, how could this have happened? Security was tight in verse 10. Two guards to whom he was chained, first and second ward, iron gate, there is no mistaking the Bible claimed that this escape was orchestrated in the plan and with the help of the Lord. Uh, Peter recognized that this was de uh, divine deliverance, and we'll pick up on page 154 in verse number 12. When he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, John Mark, the, Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, I might add, where many were gathered together praying. 
And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, this is a little humorous, is it not? A damsel, that's a damsel is a young girl. A damsel came to hearken, to listen to the knock, named Rhoda. When she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. She heard Peter calling on the outside, whatever he was saying, let me in, you know, it's Peter out here, I'd like to have entrance. But she ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. They said unto her, you're a crazy girl, what do you mean he's at the gate? But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, ah, it's just his angel, you're you're having delusions or visions or you're imagining things. It's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I think that it's interesting that here's a group of people who are praying unceasingly for Peter, and when their prayers are answered, they're surprised. I guess that's our human nature is it not we know it's right to pray Um, it it feels right it's biblically correct we know that we owe it to other people particularly people like a peter who has put his life on the line so many times we need to pray for people like that we pray for missionaries that way and other people in the ministry or we pray for personal friends and family members when we have this burden for them that, uh, you know, uh, we're asking God to free them from their malady, their illness, the constraints, the restrictions, their frustrations, because we know that they, as far as we're concerned, they've invested so much. Do they really deserve this kind of punishment or this kind of treatment? And uh, as human beings, we pray for people who we know that are in conditions like that. But then when they're freed from those conditions, when the illness goes away, when they're healed, when their frustration has been satisfied and is no longer, we astonish that God answers prayer, how weak our faith may be. So we uh, pick it up here in verse 17, but he beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. So he testifies to them of the circumstances, where he was, the constraints that were put on him, and it has to be a miracle that he was let out. Not only a miracle, but it's an answer to their prayers, trying to encourage them. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren, and he departed and went into another place. So uh, we have some notes there in verse number 12. We've mentioned the damsel's name is Rhoda. That means Rose. She's a young unmarried girl. That's how your um, King James Bible translates the Greek word damsel when it's referring to a young lady, a young unmarried lady. She's a damsel. Peter stood at the gate. God has acted upon the prayers of his people. They're astonished. Notice at the bottom of page 154, Luke speaks of Peter for the last time in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. Paul later met Peter at Antioch, Galatians 2 tells us, and later Peter wrote two letters, 1 and 2 Peter, we know that. So he doesn't totally disappear from the scene, but at this point the spotlight moves from Jerusalem and Peter to Antioch and Paul the Apostle. It appears that James became, uh, eventually became the pastor of the church that was at Jerusalem. Most accept the, uh, the fact that Peter uh, died, was martyred, somewhere between 64, 65 AD, and that this escape that we're reading about here took place about 20 years before that. Uh, Tradition says, as we have written, that Peter died of crucifixion upside down. Tradition says that he said that he wasn't worthy to be crucified the same way that his Savior was and that he wanted to be crucified differently. Whether they chose differently to be upside down or he did, I am not sure about that. In fact, 
Again, that's not biblical what I'm sharing with you. This is what tradition tells us. So in verse number 8 now, we see Peter's escape is discovered, and uh, the authorities are not happy. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. <laughs> Think about this. <laughs> Where did our prisoner go? Two chains, two soldiers, two wards, an iron gate, and he is gone. He is nowhere to be found. And no one really knows anything about this. It really is. There's a lot of humor in this story. Not only how he escaped, but then knocking at the gate of where the uh, believers were gathered to pray and they were astonished. God certainly does have a sense of humor, does he not? Well, it says in verse number 19, or excuse me, verse, yeah, verse number 19, this is 12, 18, uh, uh, there was no small stir, 12, 19, and when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers. <laughs> Are you guys, what, what were you guys doing last night? Were you drinking? Were you sleeping? Did you go and take a vacation? Did you take the shift off or what? And he commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. Well, I would suppose that what he commanded to be done to these guards is exactly what took place. Serious consequences. I know having been in the military myself and being in a combat zone, that to fall asleep on guard duty was an offense that you, that uh, in the Marine Corps, I believe, and this is a long time ago, but I believe they called it captain's mast. And if you had done something that was worthy of discipline, you were called before the unit commanding officer. And um, in my case, that would be the uh, um, captain of our, not our platoon, but our, the, the whole group, the pl three platoons, our company. That's the word I'm looking for. And uh, by the way, they would announce that, that so-and-so would be called it was uh, captain's mast was being held for such and such an individual. Everybody knew that that was happening. And, um, you know, the consequences for falling asleep in a combat zone when you're on guard duty can be very severe. It's really up to the, the commanding officer and the circumstances of that um, exactly what the punishment or payment may be. In this case, it was severe. They lost their lives because they didn't do their job. So we see Herod's arrogance being rewarded in verse number 20. Let's pick up the reading there. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. He's having some problems. He's having problems at home. He's having problems here in Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. This is a political issue going on here, obviously. And upon a set day, Herod, in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So uh, this reminds me of some of our present-day politicians when they uh, set up some kind of a press conference and they have some... some something that they're going to say that's just going to, you know, it's going to feature their intelligence, their political savvy, and we are making a statement today that is going to turn this state or country upside down. So they arrange all of this uh, fanfare to surround them to make this event as great as they possibly can. So that's what's happening here. And the people gave shouts saying, it's the voice of God and not of man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is exactly what Herod is looking for. Of course, what they're looking for, the people are looking for some political favor, obviously. It's, it, it says, because their country, verse 20, was nourished by the king's country. So they're looking for some political favors or favor, if you please. 
And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately, well, you reap what you sow. The angel of the Lord smote him. Why? Because he gave not God the glory. Whoa. Now, this, is, this isn't a Christian. This is a man who is an enemy of Christianity. Probably, not, probably more for political reasons than for spiritual or religious reasons. But nonetheless, he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. That's quite a picture there. I'm not sure if he was eaten of worms first and then gave up the ghost, but that's the order your King James Bible uh, gives that. Well, Herod went to Caesarea, which was the capital city of, uh, of Rome. It was the capital, uh, the political capital of that particular area in Judea. And Herod, as we know, was a true politician in the worst sense of the word. Actually, this event is recorded historically, again, giving credibility or lending credibility to our New Testament. In um, Josephus, in his work Antiquities, he records, bottom of page 155, he records these words concerning this event. He put on a garment made wholly of silver and of a contexture truly wonderful and came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it, shone out after a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spread a horror over those that looked intently upon him. And presently his flatterers cried out, one from one place and another from another, thought not for his good, that he was a god. A severed pain also arose, in, or severed pain, rose in his belly and began in a most violent manner when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life. That's recorded by a secular historian about the death of Herod. The story simply comes down to this, that his arrogance and pride, that he thought he could thwart the work of God and took glory in all of that, God dealt with him about that because God rules in the affairs of men, ultimately, not earthly kings. And we've given you a couple passages from the book of Daniel that only back up that statement. Verses 21 and 22 tell us a little bit more about the story, but the issue is simply this. He gave not God the glory. He was guilty of stealing glory from God and believing in his his own press reports. Man, you're just a wonderful king. Yes, I am. I'm glad you finally recognize that. You have to be careful. Maintain your humility. We can never be humble enough. We're always, we're always tempted to be arrogant, to say, look at me. Look who I was with. Look what I've done. Yes, they've done something really nice, but I'll tell you what. I know they caught a 12-inch I caught a 15-inch or two foot or three feet or whatever. We like to plug ourselves into conversations and say, yes, but I did this. You know, one more. Herod is dead. The gospel's alive. The word of God grew and multiplied, verse 24 says. And Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. So here we go. This is again, we're mentioning Paul and Barnabas. Uh, actually, it's still uh, Saul here. It's not until chapter 13 that his name is changed from Saul to Paul. So he's still referenced as Saul here in chapter number 12. In spite of the death and imprisonment of James and Peter, the opposition and the opposition, obviously, of this king, Herod, the word of God grew and multiplied. There are a number of things that are worthy to think about, and we've given you a list there. 
And the interaction of all these people, scenarios, and outcomes is humanly difficult to put all together, but in a few verses we see God working all things together for his or for the ultimate good. Bad things happen to good people, but all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. In the midst of it all, I am able to choose and will be held accountable for my choices, even during those difficult times. So what is the application here? We're going to finish up with uh, the bottom of 157 and 58. It's always important. What is the application? We've, we've read the history, we've read the account of the uh, personages, the people, uh, the places, the events that have taken place, but so what? What does this all mean to me as a Christian? Number one, God's mission will be successful. Now that's not an excuse for our laziness. We have the privilege of partnering with him, of partnering with God. That's our privilege. God will accomplish what he wants to do ultimately with or without you. He will find someone or he will find a way to get done what he wants to, to uh, get done. But we have the great privilege of partnering with the creator, the God of the universe, to get involved in what he's doing. We see the result also of fervent prayer and what takes place we ought not to be surprised at answered prayer how often do we seek the face of god in prayer beseeching him for people who are in difficult situations missionaries pastors our brothers and sisters in christ or maybe even for politicians people who are in civil leadership uh, we're to pray for we're to pray for all men not just pray for the people we like or our brothers and sisters in Christ. Once again, God's salvation does not depend upon men's abilities. We know that. There's some lessons at the bottom of the page. Let's turn the page, though. History is filled with the stories of men and women who thought that they could fight against God and succeed, like Herod himself. History is filled with people like this. I've only listed four here. This, this could be pages of the names of people, but I think all of the ones that I've listed here are familiar uh, to most of you, if not all of you. Friedrich Nietzsche, I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly. If, if I was German, I'd pronounce that probably different, differently, but you know, um, he's the God is dead guy. Well, I, he ended up uh, insane as a result of syphilis, if I'm not mistaken. Sinclair Lewis wrote Elmer Gantry. It was a novel, novel about an evangelist, supposed to be a mock of Billy Sunday, the evangelist in his day. Well, he made fun of the evangelist in the book and made him to look, to look like a hypocrite and all that. And uh, as an alcoholic, a womanizer, and Lewis himself died as an alcoholic. Voltaire vowed to eradicate the printing and, evaluate, and availability of Scripture they're printing Bibles where he said that they were. And Ernest Hemingway lived his life of adventure and sin in direct defiance to the existence and laws of God and ultimately he ended up taking his own life. I'm told that he blew his head off with a shotgun. What a way to go. Well, let's stop right there. We're going to take a break now here for just a few moments and you can have some discussion maybe ask some questions. I want to remind you, if you have any questions, if you want to email me those questions, I will get on the answers quickly, and you can directly email me and with your email address, and I will do the best I possibly can to answer any questions if your facilitator, if the instructor in your class uh, would rather have me answer that question. Sometimes I write things <laughs> that only I can be accountable for. So let's take a break.